Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, it's good to be here tonight on a Wednesday night. I am grateful for you joining with us here at New Harvest. I know that we are separated by uh, distance, but praise God, spiritually we are still together in one mind and one accord. I trust you've had a good day today. It's been a beautiful day. We've had a beautiful week outside. God has truly blessed us with beautiful weather, and um, I'm just so grateful for that. And tonight, as we open up the service, I'd look, like to open up in a, uh, a scripture that God has laid on my heart tonight out of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And while I read this, if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we're going to uh, look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20 tonight. So if you'd like to go ahead and grab your Bibles and uh, begin to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20 uh, tonight, I'd like to open up with this scripture in Ecclesiastes first. The Bible says, 
in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time to war, a time of war and a time of peace. Verse number 11 says, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. And tonight I just want to encourage you to let you know that we're in a season of time that no one could have expected us to be in. And even in this time, even in this season, when we are separated by distance, can I tell you God can still make it beautiful. I believe that God has a, a great plan for our lives. I, have a, I believe that God has a great plan for the church. I, I believe that God has something uh, in store for us that we can't even fathom. I believe that God is working out this plan even though it's not what we would have chosen, not what we would have uh, liked to have seen happen in our lives, or the life of the church. But can I tell you, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3 and 11, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. God has a timing and it's perfect. And if we would only trust in God's timing, I, I can guarantee you this, that God is going to make something beautiful out of what's taken place in this world, in our lives, in our church. I believe that we're going to come out of here stronger. We're going to come out of here better than we came into it. I believe that God is just going to do something awesome. And I know we're talking to many of you. God is even working in the days that we are living in today. God is providing and God is working in the hearts of people in your family and those that you work with and those that you're around. And I know that God is God is doing something even great even now. And I hope you believe that tonight. And I am looking forward to what God is going to do in the days ahead. And this is only a time. It's only a season. There will be a beginning and there will be an ending to it. And I look forward to the day that it ends. But what we've learned in this time, we will never, we will never forget. I know tonight that many of you probably have needs in your life. And I've heard from some of you this week of things that are taking place. I know that uh, Brother Ronnie is uh, in Georgia right now. Uh, God has provided some work for him. So we need to ask God that he'll, pr he'll protect him and watch over him while he's there. I know others have reached out to me because of uh, loved ones that are sick that need God to touch them. We're just going to pray that God will uh, touch them and heal them. I know many of you have uh, needs uh, other than that, and we're just going to lift all these up before the Lord tonight, asking him to cover them with his grace. And we just join our voices together tonight, no matter where you are. We just bow our heads, just close our eyes. Let's just take a moment uh, to go ahead before the Lord and ask God to move in this service tonight and ask God to move in the, the lives and hearts of your family and, and your needs tonight. Father God, Lord, we love you tonight, and God, we just praise you. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness, and we thank you for your grace. God, you pour out your mercy and your compassion upon us each and every day. And Lord, we are so undeserving of what you've bestowed upon us. But God, we just want to take this time and return thanks for your many blessings. God, you are so good to us. And God, we just want to praise you and worship you tonight for your goodness and your faithfulness. And God, I ask and pray tonight, Lord, for those that have needs. Lord, I know there's many that are here tonight that are watching God that have needs in their life, whether they be financial or relational or whether they be in their health. God, we know that you know them all. And God, I ask and pray, Lord, that you would touch each and every heart and each and every life tonight. God, that you would minister to these needs. God, you protect Brother Ronnie, Lord, as he travels and while he's away from his family. God, you just protect him and watch over him. And God, I ask and pray, Lord, for the families of the church, God, that you just put a hedge of protection around them, that you would guard them. And Lord, for all those that are listening tonight, God, I ask and pray, dear God, that you would just encamp angels around them and that you would guard their possessions. God, you would guard their hearts and God, you would guard uh, their, their health. And God, I ask and pray, Lord, that you would just be with them, watch over them and keep them. God, I ask for the message tonight and the Lord, the service, God, that you would just anoint it. God, that you would anoint me to preach. God, 
you would open up the ears of the hearers, Lord, that you would just allow them to be able to receive what the Spirit is going to say to them tonight. God, I ask and pray, Lord, that you would just do a work in each and every heart. God, that you would encourage us most of all through your word. God, I ask and pray, Lord, at the conclusion of this message, Father, that we would look to you for everything in our life. And God, that you would just be with us, that you would lead us and guide us and direct us into the path you'd have us to take. And Father, for what you do, we won't fail to give you glory and praise for who you are and all that you've done. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Tonight, if you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 tonight. We're going to look at, we're going to continue to look at this uh, passage of scripture tonight. I believe it's very relevant for where we are uh, in a, in, in, as individuals, as, as a nation, as the world. Uh, we uh, are in a, a world crisis, a, a national crisis, and uh, that's where we find ourselves in this passage in Second Chronicles chapter 20. They were in a crisis, but praise God, when anytime we find ourselves in difficult circumstances or situation, God always has an answer, God always has a plan, and God always has as a way of escape, praise God. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we're going to start in verse number 12, the last uh, verse we looked at. Uh, we're going to pick up there tonight, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, in verse number 12, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, in verse 12, this is Jehoshaphat at the end of his prayer, after praying uh, to God, after the three armies were come against him, he says, O our God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that comes against us. Neither know what we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Verse 13. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, and the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. Verse 15. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah. And inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go ye down against them, behold, they come up by the Clippenses, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle, set yourselves. Stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And can I tell you tonight, uh, I would like to preach, praise God. Hear what the Spirit has to say. Hear what the Spirit has to say. May God add his blessings upon his word tonight. If you remember from last week, King Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel had three gigantic armies that were closing in on them, and the children of Israel had no way of defeating them. The armies that were coming out against them were larger, they were stronger, and they were far more powerful than the army of Israel. Isn't that how it is in life? We're living life, minding our own business, just serving the Lord, doing what he's called us to do. Then the enemy of our soul comes against us. The trials and troubles of life, they start closing in. And they always seem larger, stronger, and more powerful than what we can handle. So when Jehoshaphat heard that they were uh, on their way, he was confronted by these armies. And he did the only thing that he knew to do. The Bible says he set himself to seek the Lord. He called a fast. And when we find ourselves dealing with situations and that are almost overwhelming and seem impossible, we need to do as King Jehoshaphat did. And we need to set ourselves to seek the Lord. And if we need to, we need to get in his presence and we need to fast before him. And we need to get to the place where we seek his face so we can find the answers that we need and his guidance and direction in our life. Church. This is the hour. This is the time to seek the Lord with the whole heart. The Bible says of that King Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel, they assembled themselves together to seek the Lord. Jehoshaphat first sought the Lord by himself, and then he called the congregation together to seek the Lord together. There's something about the people of God getting together and seeking the Lord that pow the power of God is able to move in a great and mighty way. And as the King Jehoshaphat, as he prayed, he said, I have no might against 
against this great company that cometh against us. He was saying that he had no power to overcome them. He said he had no strength to overcome this great army and defeat it. He said, Lord, they're coming against us and there's nothing that we can do. So what King Jehoshaphat was doing is he was admitting his weakness. Oh, church, it's okay to admit our weakness before the Lord. It's okay to tell God that we have no strength to defeat the enemy because it's the truth and he already knows it that we don't have the power or the strength compared to the power of the enemy the devil himself or his minions we are powerless against him without the power of God in our life so there is nothing wrong with telling God how weak we are even Paul the apostle told God how weak he was in 2 Corinthians when God come to him and he'd asked three times about the thorn in the flesh being removed he said I asked God Lord three times for it to remove and the Bible says he said unto me my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength God speaking for my strength is made perfect in weakness God's strength when we admit our weakness when we say God we can the Bible says he says my strength is made perfect in weakness when we are weak God is strong where our weaknesses they come into our life and we know that we are God's strength is able to move through us when we admit our weakness then God can do the things that only God can do he can show us and those around us his great strength but as long as we want to take control as long as we want to say I got this as long as we want to say watch what I can do then God doesn't have the power to move so oftentimes God will position us in a place where the only one that's going to help us through and the only way we're going to make it is if God comes through in a great and mighty way wasn't it Samson that admitted his weakness he had lost all his strength he had no power they put him between the two pillars and he cried he cried out to God one more time he said Lord strengthen me this one last time and God gave him the strength that he needs you see we have to get to the place where we're willing to admit that we don't have all the answers we got to get to the place where we admit that we don't have all the strength but when we do that God is able to step in and we can watch God do more than we could ever do in our life then the king Jehoshaphat admitted neither know what we to do. So not only did King Jehoshaphat admit that he didn't have enough strength, but then he admitted that he didn't have even the knowledge to be able to come up with a plan that could overcome what the enemy had brought against him. Church, there are times in our life in the situation that we're in right now we can't come up with a plan to overcome what we're facing. There is nothing that we can think of or nothing that we can do. But if we would just look to God, if we would rely upon him, the Bible says that Jehoshaphat said, our our eyes are upon you. Our eyes are looking towards you. God, we know that you got this. We know that you got a plan. I don't know what it is. I don't have the strength, but God, I am fully and completely dependent on you. Oh, when we get to that place where we rely upon him, the Bible says, lift up your eyes and look to the hills from whence comes our help. Our help comes from the Lord. Church, our help comes from and through and by the Lord. In times like these, praise God, the Bible says in verse 13, And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives and their children. The Bible said all of Judah. In times like these, we have got to come together. Even though we can't meet together, we've got to stay together. We must be the body of Christ. This is not the time to point fingers. It's not the time for division. It's not the time for dissension. It's the time for all of us to come together in one mind and one accord. The Bible says that all Judah stood before the Lord. Not just the men, not just the women, not just the children, but everyone. This was a time where the generational gap was closed. It was time to stand together no matter what the age or what the background. This was a desperate hour that Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel were in. And they realized the importance of coming together to come in one mind and one accord. Church, we are in a desperate hour today. We are in a time like we have never seen in our lifetime. Now is the time to put all differences aside and stand together. The enemy's at hand. The end is near. And we must, as the body of Christ, come together as one and be who God has called us to be. Praise the Lord. But how many know when we look to God that God is able to answer? 
The Bible says he looked to God and he said, our eyes are upon thee. On verse 13, they all stood together. Then in verse 14, it's no accident. It's no coincidence. It's not just happenstance. What takes place in verse 14? If we didn't have what took place in the early part of the passage where Jehoshaphat sought the Lord and called a fast and brought the assembly together, if we didn't have him saying, Lord, I can't, but you can. Lord, I don't even know what to do. I don't have the strength, but our eyes are upon you. Had all those not taken place, we wouldn't have the privilege to read what's in verse 14. You see, Jehoshaphat didn't go to the armory and say, hey guys, let's suit up. Let's go ahead and defeat this enemy or let's do our best. The first thing he did before he drew out the swords and kicked out the chariots hooked up to the horses, before he ever did anything in the natural, in the flesh, he fell on his face before God and sought him church. Before we do anything, the first thing we need to do is get before God and say, God, I can't can but you can had all that not taken place we wouldn't have what is written in verse 14 and the bible says in verse 14 and upon jehaziah the son of zechariah the son of beniah the son of jael the son of metaniah the uh, levite of the son of asaph came the spirit of the lord in the midst of the congregation you see in the old testament the spirit of god would come upon individuals and empower them with great strength of the word of god and they would prophesy and they would do great and mighty exploits for the word of god you see at that time the spirit of god individually came upon people it wasn't like it is today where we have the privilege of the spirit of god being poured out as the bible said in the book of acts upon all flesh but when praise god when they got together the spirit of God showed up. The same principle applied in that day as it does today. You see, when you focus on God, His Spirit will start to move. When His Spirit starts moving, the Word of God will go forth. Just look at the day of Pentecost. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, when they were in one mind and one accord, remember Jehoshaphat, all the children, all the wives, all the husband, everyone was together. When they were in one mind and one accord, the Bible says in the book of Acts, the Spirit of God they move in a mighty way the Bible says that cloven tongues of the fires rested upon each of them and they spoke with other tongues and then what happened Peter went on the porch and when he did he spoke under the influence and the power of the spirit of God he preached the message and 3,000 souls were saved let me tell you when the spirit of God starts moving the word of God will start being spoken by the people of God then the spirit of God moved and 3,000 souls were saved you see, we need to get in our prayer closets and ask God to move on us one more time to fill us with the Spirit to the full so we have the power to go out and share the gospel message. This lost and dying world needs to know that there's God in heaven, a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, that the love of God and mercy is still covering the earth and calling people home. The Bible says, praise God, that when the Spirit of God came down, that when Peter went out, he preached the Word of God. Anytime the anytime time you, the spirit is present the word of God will go forth the Bible says when John was in the Isle of Patmos the Bible says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day and when he was in the spirit what happened the word of God was given to John and we know that book today as the revelation which is the last book of the Bible you see the Bible itself was written as the Spirit of God was moved upon those that wrote. Understand the Spirit of God moved upon Paul as he wrote the letters to those churches that are now part of the gospel, part of the Bible canon of Scripture. As God moved through the Spirit of God and they moved their pens, it was literally the Spirit of God and His Word being written out for us to be able to have today, to be able to guide us and direct us in this life. So when the Word of God was written, it was moved by the inspiration inspiration of the power of God. You see the Spirit started moving and the Word of God will go forth in power. You know the only offensive weapon that is given in the praise God Ephesians chapter 6 when the armor of God is being detailed. The only offensive weapon there is the Bible says it's called the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You see, you've got to have the Spirit of God to even understand the Word of God. And you need to have the Word of God to allow the Spirit of God to move. What draws people to Christ? But the Word of God and the Spirit of God that convicts and brings them to a place of repentance. The Spirit of God and the Word of God work hand in hand. You see, the Word of God that was spoken to King 
Jehoshaphat and the Israelites, they are just uh, as relevant today as they were back then. The same word that was given by the same Spirit is still relevant to us today. So I want you to hear what the Spirit has to say to us tonight. In verse 14 and 15, praise God, the Bible lets us know the Spirit of God came upon Jehaziah and he began to speak the word of God. He, he said, thus saith the Lord. I'm going to tell you tonight, right now, a thus saith the Lord changes everything. The word of God changes everything in life. I don't care what the banker says or the doctor says or what the lawyer says. I want to know what does the Lord say. I don't matter. I don't care. It doesn't matter what people are saying about the economy or what the economy is saying or the government saying. I want to know what the Lord is saying. Is there a word for the Lord from the Lord for this hour? One word from God changes changes everything. One word from God makes us unshakable. One word from God makes us unbeatable. One word from God will turn famine into plenty, sickness into health, weakness into strength, drought into floods, and nothing into too much. One word from God will close doors that no man can open, and one word from God will open doors that no man can shut. One word from God will set the captives free. One word from God can take a lost person and bring him to a place where they look to Jesus for salvation. Matthew 8 and 8, the Bible says the centurion came to Jesus and said, praise God, and on behalf of the servant that was sick, he said, I come, and, 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 and Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. He said, I'll come and heal him. But the centurion said, don't worry about coming, Lord. All I want you to do is just say the word. All I want you to do is speak the word. Send the word only, and the servant will be healed. Can I tell you, if we would just hear what the Spirit has to say tonight, the Word of God can encourage your heart and can strengthen you to help you through whatever you're going through tonight. Praise the Lord. In verse 15, the Bible says, as the Spirit of God speaks the Word of God, the Bible says in verse 15, the first thing he says is fear not. Don't be afraid. Be not afraid. God wants them to know, hey, listen, I know that on the horizon are three major armies that have enough power to defeat you and your army, but don't be afraid. What he's telling us tonight is there's things on the horizon. There's things all around us, and he's telling us don't be afraid. You see, fear will never change your circumstances. Fear will never conquer the enemy. Fear will only destroy your faith. God speaks to his children over and over again in the word of God and he says in Isaiah 41 fear not for I am with thee. He says again fear not for I will help thee. For Isaiah 43 fear not for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name. Thou art mine. In Luke 12 he says fear not therefore praise God. Fear not therefore ye are more valuable than any sparrow. Then the spirit says not only Fear not or don't be afraid. The Spirit of God says, nor dismay. Don't be dismayed. That means God tell him, don't be stressed out. Don't be distraught. Don't be troubled and don't be concerned. Listen, church, don't be in fear and don't be discouraged or dismayed. Don't be overwhelmed with stress or distraught or troubled or concerned. Isaiah 41 says, fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Church, and thank God that was the God before the virus. It's still the same God in the virus. The same God that was outside of the fiery furnace is the same God that is inside the fiery furnace. The same God that was outside the lion's den is the same God that was in the lion's den with Daniel. No matter where you are or what you go through, can I tell you God is still the same God, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Spirit of God told King Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel, he said, don't be afraid and don't be dismayed. And the Spirit of God is telling you tonight the very same thing. Don't be afraid and don't be dismayed. Don't be worried and overwhelmed by what you see. Don't be worried and overwhelmed by what you hear. You see, the Bible says there's a great multitude. What, the, what does it say? Great? It's more than what they could fathom. What they were coming up against was greater than what they could deal with. Church, in our life, there are things that are greater than we can handle. Greater than what we can deal with. The circumstances 
circumstances are overwhelming beyond even comprehension that we can't we can't handle. But regardless of how big the crisis is, regardless of how big the problem is, stop focusing on the problem and start focusing on God. Stop telling stop telling people how big the virus is and start telling people how big our God is. Don't focus on the virus. Focus on God. Don't focus on your struggle. Focus on God. We still serve the water walker. We still serve the one that can make a, a valley in the mountaintop. We still serve the one that can take a, a, a river and make it clear so that people can walk through. We still serve a God that rains manna from heaven and bring water from a rock. We still serve a God that's able tonight. If you focus on the problem, it's very easy to fall in the grip of fear. If you let fear influence you, it'll push you to the point where you'll do things you shouldn't do or you'll be afraid to do things that you should do. Don't let fear stop you from doing what God wants you to do if God is speaking to you. If God is telling you to do something, don't let fear keep you from doing what God wants you to do. There are all kinds of amazing things that many of you are doing even in this time. I want to encourage you. Keep doing what God is speaking to your heart. Don't let fear stop you from accomplishing God's will. Then the Spirit of God only said, don't be afraid and don't be dismayed. Then he says these words in verse 15. He says, the battle is not yours. But God's. Ask yourself, where's your battle tonight? Is it in your marriage? Is it in your job? Is it in your finances? Is it in your health? Is it in your relationships? Is it in your mind? Is it in your heart? Does the battle get more intense day by day? You see, if you have a heart for Jesus and a desire to cleave to him, you'll face the rage of the devil and his minion time and time again. But can I tell you that this still is not your battle. Even though anybody comes against you, even the enemy himself comes against you, even the battle, even that face us every day, those battles are not ours. They are the Lord's. Stop trying to fight all these battles and let God be the captain of your salvation. Let God be the great warrior that he is. He is the one that is able. In ourselves we have no strength. We have no power. Our eyes are upon God. Sometimes we get so used to handling our business. So used to handling the things in our lives. When things come up that we can't handle, sometimes we don't know what to do. But that's when we turn to God and say, God I can, but Lord you can. Can I tell you, we still have our part in the battle. Oh, he fights the battle for us, but we still have our part in the battle. We need to trust. We need to believe his promises in the face of hopelessness and what seems to be impossible. we got to continue to believe that God is still on the throne, that he's still at work, that his word is still yes and amen in Jesus. Faith demands us to turn over all our problems, all our struggles, all our fears, all our anxiety into the hand of God. Our job is to turn it all over to the Lord. The Bible says, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. You see, our God in heaven longs for us to turn over our doubt and our fear and our problems and our worry to him. Why? Because he cares for us. You as parents tonight, you know how much you love your children and you want to sometimes carry all your children's burdens. You want to help fix everything for them and you can but the great news is is that our Heavenly Father is big enough to handle all of His children's problems and all of our circumstances and all of our needs. He can do what we can so now more than ever turn them over to God. Turn your battles over to Him. Turn your situations. He says praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Come into me all you that are weary and are heavy laden and I will give you rest how do we how, how do we how do we find rest in him how will they we that are weary and are heavy labored how do we get rest we turn all of our all of our problems all of our difficulties all of our worries all of our needs over to him and let him stay up all night quit quit losing sleep quit losing your 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 your, your time that can be productive on worry and doubt and let God handle it for you. He's big enough to take care of it all. You see, when I've done all I can do, I know my battles. 
is beyond my power. I must just submit to him and say, God, it's all yours. You see, if you'll just hold fast to your faith and trust in him and rest in his promises and reject all the lies of Satan that come to your mind and just expect God to show up in your situation and bring an expected end to your battle, he will more than able, he is more than able and more than willing to move heaven and earth on your behalf to deliver you and make a way where there is no way. But just because we believe, just because we trust, does not mean that God is going to work on our timetable. God's timetable is often times different. Why? Because he wants to know how much we trust him. How much do we believe? He wants to draw us into a place of a closer relation where our total reliance and dependence upon him is there. He's not a genie in the bottle where we, uh, we make a request today and it's done today. Now sometimes there are things that take place that literally are almost instantaneously praise God. But sometimes we must wait until God's timing has come to pass. You see, the way out of our problems is trust, trust, and trust some more. The Bible says he makes war of the seeds in Psalms 46. Where we really need to start trusting is not in action but adoration. What we really need to start doing is not worry about what we need to do, but just start giving God praise and glory. We need to start, what we really need to start with is not work but worship. We need to stop trying to fix everything and just spend some time alone with God in his presence, worshiping him before who he is and all these things. We don't need to be proactive about everything. We just need to sometimes just be in the given praise. Don't just do something, but sit there and give God glory. So many times our mind is so locked up in how to work everything and how to fix everything and how to make everything right when all that time or some of that time can be used to give God glory and praise. And when we make much of Him, He'll move in and He'll take care of the problems that we face. If we are going to be victorious, we must realize two things. It's not our battle, it's God's. And we, praise God, don't have the resources to win. We are smart enough and we aren't strong enough. When we get over ourselves and realize we don't know it all and we don't have it all, praise God, God can really start to do some things in our life. And that that's why oftentimes he backs us in a corner where we have nowhere to turn but God. And then we look to God and say, God, I need you to work. And then he's able to do great and mighty things for the glory of God. Praise the Lord. And that's where Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel found themselves. He said, we don't know what to do. We don't have the strength to do it. But our eyes were upon you. And God said, the battle is not yours. The battle is mine. A little shepherd boy by the name of David knew this all too well in 1 Samuel 17 and 47 when the nation of Israel was being threatened by the Philistine giant Goliath in verse number 47 of 1 Samuel 17 he said in all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword or with the spear why for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands and little David was out there with a stone that he swiped up from the book with four other ones and there he was twiddling that, uh, that, that thing around. He was saying, hey, look, buddy, I know you're big. I know you're strong. I know that you can have me for lunch, but praise God, my God doesn't my God doesn't win and doesn't need a sword and a spear. All he needs is some willing vessel that has enough faith to believe that even though I might be small, I might be nothing in the eyes of men around me, but praise God, with God I am almighty. I am powerful through him and God's going to show you how great he is. Praise God. He released that stone and that giant fell. Stop worrying about trying to figure everything out. Go in faith. Get what you need and get on the battlefield and watch God work and watch God move because it's not in our strength. It's not in our power. The Bible says it's not by strength nor by might, but by my spirit says the Lord. God wants the glory. God wants the victory. God wants his name to be raised up because of what he's done in your life. That's oftentimes why we find ourselves in defeat because we want to do it. But let God be God. Praise God and let him come through for you and give him the praise for what he's done. Praise the Lord. Church, the battles that you face in your life are not yours. What we're experiencing around us in this moment in time, the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. 
Then the Bible says in verse 17, the Bible says in verse 17, it says, and you shall not need to fight in this battle. All he says to do is set yourself. He didn't say, make, grab your swords, grab your spears, grab all your armor, grab everything that you need. No, what God, through the Spirit of God, what the Spirit was saying, he said, set yourself. Position yourself. That phrase, set yourself, means to place something so that is, is to stay put. You see, God wants us to place ourselves in the position of faith and stay put. Don't allow the enemy to move you from the position that God has put you in. Don't let God, don't let the enemy uh, move you from the position that God has placed you in. Don't let the enemy move you from the place of trusting God and putting your faith in Him for your deliverance. Determine in your heart that you're going to stay put, that you're going to be positioned in faith, and that nothing's going to move you. Nothing's going to move you from the position that you're in. Set yourself. It's time. If there was ever a time to have a man made up mind. It is in 2020. Praise God. This April, this moment right now, April 8th is now the time to set yourself. Make your mind up. Realize that there is nothing else in this world that can bring security. There's nothing else in this world that can bring what you need in this life. But while everything is turned upside down, my God is still solid as a rock. His word is yes. His word is true. Yes, it's a foundation that we can stand upon. we got to make up our mind and set ourselves. The Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church tonight, set yourself. Plant yourself. Be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. Get rooted and grounded in your faith. Now more than ever, God needs a church that's planted on the solid rock. I just went in the yard today. We bought some pepper plants from the food line just down the road. And we, what I did is I planted them. I put them in a stationary place. Now I've had some plants and some flowers. I wasn't sure where I was going to plant them. And they were in those little black, uh, little black things that you plant plants in, those little planters. And we moved them from place to place. And, and they would often sit there and they wouldn't get watered. They wouldn't get nourished. And they just died. Why? Because they weren't planted. Oh, they were in a location, but they could be easily lifted up and moved. Their roots weren't able to take hold of the ground, and the ground wasn't able to hold the plant. Let me tell you, I planted those peppers a day. You know why I planted them there? Because I knew the only way they could survive, the only way they were going to bear fruit, the only way they were going to accomplish what they were created for was to set them where they needed to be in church. If we are going to be fruitful in this hour and the hours and days and weeks and months and years to come we must set ourselves we must plant ourselves we must let the root of our spiritual life get founded and grounded in the word of God in our faith in Jesus Christ we must plant ourselves we must set ourselves we must have a made up mind to realize that we shall not be moved the reason why so many people are fail in the Christian life is because they go from church to church from place to place they're looking for a feeling or a sensation and when it's no longer there they go to the next place that's the hot spot until they realize that they need to go somewhere else. What God needs today are people that will plant their roots, that say, I shall not be moved, that realize that they need to set themselves because they need a foundation that they can live their life and build their life upon because there are people all around us that desperately need salvation and desperately need people that are planted. Praise God. The Bible says that Jehoshaphat told him to plant. To set yourself. In Psalm 62, David says this. My soul waits only upon God. For my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. David makes the declaration. I shall not be moved. Because of who God is to him, he tells him he'll wait. Because David's expectation is from God. Because God is his only rock. You see, when you think that you have another source in 
life. When you think that there's something else other than God that can take care of your needs, you will never be planted. But David said, God only is my rock. His mind was made up. He had drawn from every well he could think of. But the only well that never run dry was that in God. In God alone, he realized it was the only place that he could be. He said, because of God is his only salvation. My Bible says there is salvation in none other than Jesus Christ. His is the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is the only way of salvation. There is no other way to heaven. There is no other way to the pearly gates, to the presence of God, to see Jesus, our Lord and Savior, through all eternity. Because God is his defense, that, as David said, as David is waiting for God to move in his life, David declared, I shall not be moved. Tonight, as we are waiting for God to move, every single one of us tonight needs to declare, I shall not be moved. The Bible says, the Spirit says, set yourself. You see, as we wait for this virus to pass, we must wait upon the Lord and we must declare, I shall not be moved. Set yourself. Hold your position. Ephesians 6 said this when he talking about, before he talks about the armor of God and having done all to stand, stand. That means we need to stand guard. The Spirit of God is telling us tonight to set ourselves. Set yourself in a rightful position with God. Set yourself firmly on your prayer line. Set yourself and don't let your faith waver or be moved. Declare as David did, I shall not be moved. And when we set ourselves and determine I shall not be moved, it means that there's no inside or outside influence that has the ability to move us from where I currently am. There's nothing or nobody that can move me from where I am today. We need to be determined. We need to be resolute. We need to have a made up mind that we shall not be moved. Who will say with me tonight, I shall not be moved. I don't care what the storm may come my way. I shall not be moved. I don't care the opposition that mounts against me. I will not be moved. I don't care how hopeless the situation may look in front of me. Today I declare, I shall not be moved. Church, what is the Spirit telling the church tonight? What did the Spirit tell Jehoshaphat? We need to say with authority and declaration to God and man that I shall not be moved. We should be headed straight to the enemy's location and we should take our place on the front line and say, I shall not be moved. The Bible says upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It gives the picture of the church at the gates of hell. Those that are holding all those that don't know Christ and we should be on the front line believing for God to save and to work and to move and to bring all those that don't know Jesus to a place where they can find His grace and mercy and make them Lord and Savior of their life. Verse 17 tells us when we take our place in the front line, we don't need to fight that battle. The Bible says, stand still. Understand this is the battle plan that God through the Spirit of God is speaking to King Jehoshaphat and the people. If you go back through the Word of God and look at the battle plans that God has given to His people, most of them didn't make sense. Most of them didn't make sense in how they could win. But when it looks like you can't win, when it looks like you've been counted out, when it looks like there's no hope, when it looks like the devil has you back, back against the road, when it looks like there's no way, my God, the way maker shows up and makes a way where there is no way. He'll open up the Red Sea. He'll open up the den of the lion's mouth. He'll open up, praise God, the fiery furnace, and you'll come out on the other side, not even smelling like smoke. And in situations like that, what makes those stories in the Word of God so awesome is that God gets all the glory. If we would just surrender and say, God, I can watch Him come through with victory in your life. The Bible Bible says that they need to uh, praise God, that they need to, to stand still. That they need to set themselves and stand still. 
God didn't tell Jehoshaphat and his army to set themselves, get in the battle position, and then start swinging the sword. No, he said, just show up. Sometimes we just got to show up to the fight. Praise God. We don't even have to fight. We just got to be there. Why? Because when God comes through and we don't have to lift our sword, when we don't have to come up against, can I tell you, God is our defender. And when we're just standing still and God does what he does, he alone will get the glory. He alone will get the praise. But the thing is, is that he says to get to the front lines, plant yourself and stand still. Now, why did he tell them to stand still? Because when you get up to the fight, oftentimes fear and doubt and worry begin to grip your heart as you see the enemy right in front of you as you realize the time is getting short and that you realize that what you need is right here right now the time in which you need something is right this minute and there's no way for you to get it can I tell you in that moment is when God shows up it's the woman at Zarephath that had a couple sticks and she had a little bit of meal and a little bit of oil you see she was on the front line of a battle for her life to be able to have enough of food to provide for her and her sons. There she was. She was walking to the fire with sticks and the last little bit of meal, the last little bit of oil. There she was. The time was at hand that when she made the next cake, that is all that she had. But at that moment, when it seemed like God was not going to show up and God wasn't going to come through and there was no hope as she was walking to the front line then God showed up church hear me tonight when it seemed impossible when it seems like there's no way just stand still hold on to your faith set yourself and see the salvation of the Lord the Bible says praise God and when you set yourself and stand still you will see the salvation of the Lord you see you are in the making of a miracle miracles begin to happen when you just stand and when you wait and rely upon God oh can I tell you when Noah built that ark oh people think man they built the ark he built it and everyone laughed at him everyone scoffed at him everyone believed that it would not take place but the day came the door was shut and the rain began to fall and on that day they were saved they were raised up above the difficulties and the situation understand God is working on your behalf you don't praise God we won't have to talk about what God did in the past we can start talking about what God has done today as I've talked to some of you I've heard how God has worked in your life amidst what we're facing and God is working today oh there's great stories about how God worked in the past oh there's great stories about how God worked yesterday but I'm hearing stories about how God is working today and as I look to the future as I look to the future for you and your families and I see God working miracles and doing amazing things in your life as I look to the future for our church I see God doing great and miraculous things I see God making a way where there is no way I see God working and moving I see lives changed and rearranged for the glory and honor of God I'm talking about people that never thought they would ever see the day they would enter a church building where they come and give their heart to Jesus. I'm talking about people that are so hardened to the gospel today. They're so bound by sin that the day comes when they come shaking knees, tear-filled eyes, coming to the altar to say, God, forgive me. Lord, save me. I'm looking for the day that God works in a great and miraculous way. I'm just believing that God will. All we got to do, the Bible says, is set yourself be planted. I shall not be moved. Then we stand still. My Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Church, how do we know that God is God and we're not? When we're standing still, God is still working. God is still moving. God wants the glory for it all. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Then the Bible says, Spirit of God tells them once again, O Judah, O Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. You see, after God spoke to him, God wanted to reassure him. Now you read this and you think, man, well, God just spoke. They should just follow it. Well, every one of us tonight that are listening, 
God has spoken things to you and you've stopped. And you think, oh my goodness, I can't do that. That can't be God. You know, God asked you to give a certain amount. Oh, I can't do that. God asked you to pay for someone's groceries. I heard a testimony of someone. They were in line just last week. God laid it on their heart to pay for their groceries. God and his awesome wisdom and might and power, if we will listen to what God is saying, if we will listen to what God is speaking, if we will hear what the Spirit has to say, God will move in a great and mighty way. He says, don't fear nor be dismayed at the end of verse number 18. He says, don't fear in verse number 17. Don't be in fear and don't be dismayed. What he says is, tomorrow, I want you to go up. He says, tomorrow, praise the Lord. He says, tomorrow, go out against them. For the Lord will be with you. Can I tell you, when you listen to God and you listen to his plan and you go in faith, he'll give you the timing. For them, it was tomorrow. Can I tell you, they went the next day. They went out on the authority of God's word. They went to a place and they were confident in God. Why? Because the Bible says that God says, I will go with you. I'll go before you. I'll go there with you. You see, you can have confidence when God is with you. When you've got God on your side, you can move forward in confidence. The Bible says, praise God, if God be for me, who could be against me? The great news about God is that when we're doing what God wants us to do and He is with us, praise God, He is for us and no one can be against us. You see, when we go out to face the enemy, when we go out and deal with the battles and the struggles of life, go out in confidence knowing that God is right by your side. He will leave you or forsake you. He'll guide you. He'll be with you. So go to the front lines. Stand there. Be still. Don't be afraid and watch. Watch God work in a great and mighty way. The battle's not yours. The battle's not mine. The battle's the Lord's. And after hearing the word of God, the Bible says in verse number 18, that Jehoshaphat bowed his head and his face to the ground. The Bible says that all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord and worshiped the Lord. When the word of God came, when the word of God was spoken, can I tell you the Bible says they fell down and worshiped. When we receive the word of God and with an open heart on falls on good ground, can I tell you we have nothing else to do but to worship God who is in control, who's able to make a way where there is no way, who's able to overcome the enemy. We worship him and give him praise for his goodness, his faithfulness, for his grace, for his mercy, for how he watches over us. The list goes on and on. All the reasons why we can worship. You see, when we receive the word of God, it's automatic for us to worship him and give him glory. The Bible says that he bowed his head and his face to the ground and all drew with him. And then verse 19, and the Levites, the children of the Kohathites, and, and, and the, the children of the Korites stood up and praised the Lord God of Israel. So the word was given. The battle plan was spoken. He told them to not be afraid, to not be dismayed. They began to worship. Then the Bible says that while they were worshiping, the singers got up and they began to praise. Now I love what it says in verse 19 as we close tonight. The Bible says they stood up and praised the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. I don't know who in the world thought it was a good idea for the people in the house of God to silently worship God because all through scripture when victory was on the way, when victory was right around the corner, when victory, when they were at the doorstep of victory in Jericho, the Bible says, and they shouted and the walls came down. And when Je Jehoshaphat was given the battle plan after they worshiped, they stood up and not with a quiet voice, not with a meek boy voice, but with with a loud voice on high, they begin to give God praise and give Him glory for all that He was getting ready to do. They weren't praising Him for what He just did. Oh, they were thankful. They were praising Him for the Word. But they were believing. They were praising Him because they knew victory was right around the corner. I believe some of you tonight need to get excited. I believe some of you need tonight you need to shout in your pajamas and just get excited because victory is right around the corner. 
corner. I want you to hear me. We might not be in the house of God tonight together, but victory. This thing is going to be over right around the corner. There's going to be a day when we file in those doors and we're sitting in this room and the worship of God will begin to read the rafters and we'll begin to sing and praise and give glory to God. The word will go forth. The day is coming. Victory is at hand. And why don't we do what they did when they were in a national crisis? They worshiped when they heard the word of God and they stood and they praised God with a loud voice. So where you're at, why not shout? Why you're at, why not give God a praise that will raise the raptors in your house? Give God a glorious praise, a marvelous praise because he is worthy. The Bible says, praise God. They praised him with a loud voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Victory is on the way. Victory is right around the corner. Can I tell you, whatever you're facing tonight, it's not going to last forever. Whatever you're dealing with, it's not going to last forever. You see, well, what, if, what, if, what if it lasts my entire lifetime? If it does, there's coming a day where it end. If you just stand your ground and you stand still and you believe until you get there. When you get there, can I tell you, whatever problems you are facing, the Bible says we're going to a place where there'll be no more tears. There'll be no heartache. There'll be no pain. There'll be no doctors. There'll be no sickness. Even if you were to deal with what you're dealing with all the way on this side of glory, there is coming a day of victory for all those that believe in what a day that'll be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face, the one that saved me by his grace, when I take him by the hand and he leads me through the promised land. What a day, what a glorious day that'll be. So you might as well shout because victory is on the way. And I want you to hear what the Spirit says to you tonight. Father God, Lord, we just love you. And God, we praise you. Lord, I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you for your people. God, I ask and pray, Lord, a special blessing upon each one of them tonight. God, that you would strengthen their hearts. Lord, they would draw from this word in the days ahead. And God, that they would they would continually realize, Father, that, 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 that there's so much to give you worship and praise for. And in those days of discouragement, when things seem overwhelming, Lord, I ask and pray that you would put a shout in their heart and they would lift up their voice to you. And God, they would give you praise for the victory that's ahead. God, I praise you and thank you. Ask and pray, dear God, that you put a hedge of protection around your people. God, that you would bring us back again on Sunday morning, Resurrection Day, to hear from you again. And Father, for what you do, we'll give you praise. In Jesus' precious name, amen. As we close tonight, talking about a, a, a loud voice, I want us to, on the count of three, for where you're at, the loudest shout of hallelujah that you can get, make your neighbors hear it down the block, here we go. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Leave with the blessings of the Lord in your life.